Welcome, everybody, back to the Rooted and Edified show. I'm your host, Caddy Lias, and you are in for a special treat today. Our episode is titled Occultism in and out of the church. And to review this topic with us, you are in for a special treat with a special man that I love very much, my mm-hmm. husband, who is co-host of this show and also our guest. So w- please welcome Manny Elias. Hello. Happy dance for you. Woo. Woo. Ooh. Before we jump in, I want to tell you a little bit more about this podcast. This podcast, The Rude and Edified Show, is a fun-loving, no-facade, Christian, biblical worldview show for both men and women who want to know more about the four T's, testimonies, topics, talents, and theology, of course. And if we can get a few laughs on the side, we're definitely happy with that. Absolutely. The Root and Edified Show wants to help you deepen your relationship with Christ and help you grow mature along your walk. This podcast is an audio podcast, or it's also a video podcast. So whichever it is that you prefer, there's something available to you. And if you have, are watching this podcast or listening and you're really encouraged by this or you want to help out in some way, you want to contact us, check out our website, which is www.beautifullyrooted.com, which is spelled B-E-Y-O-U. Beautifully Rooted is a ministry that I have for women, and that is a sponsor of this show. And speaking of which, I'm wearing a Rooted shirt, a Jeremiah 17, 7, 8 shirt. If you want to check it out, go on our website where you can contact us or you can check out our shirt and we'll send it to you. Okay, I think we should just jump in. Manny Elias is a happily married man. Absolutely. Did you see how I put that in there? Yes, I did. (laughs) Of course I did. We have seven children, ages 6 to 23. He works in real estate and loans, and he is a financial trading technical analyst. That is a tongue twister. (laughs) He is a theologian at heart who earned a bachelor's degree, was unaccredited, but it was a substantial bachelor's degree in missiology, correct? Yes. He was saved by the grace of God. He developed a love for God's word and praise the Lord that he was given a gift of biblical knowledge. Amen. Praise God for that. He is co-host of this show, of course, and he is our chief biblical consultant with Beautifully Rooted. So now let's jump in to this really big topic on occultism. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that we just released an episode on cults. This that we're talking about today is occultism. So it's different. It's not really a word that we throw around every day, I guess, unless you're a theologian at heart here. So just so that everybody's on the same page, what is occultism? All right. Well, we do have a slight advantage in Spanish where we use a lot of words that are derived from Latin. And this particular word is derived from Latin. In Spanish, we use it a lot. And as children, we hear it a lot. For example, when our parents ask us, don't hide something from me. We say, me estás ocultando algo. Estás ocultando, we say, right? And when we're in service in church, we say, vamos al culto, the cult, which literally just means public worship or worship of God. We're going to have to let Anna yeah. Kitko know that yeah, worship, from our last right? episode. And, and in, in Spanish, when we say oculto, it's the opposite of public. It's secret. It's hidden. Like, what are you hiding from me? So when we use it, in, in this sense, occultism, what it literally means is hidden or secret knowledge. And since cult is public worship, occult is secret or hidden worship. Now, from a biblical perspective, it literally means to seek knowledge of the spiritual realm and even in some form seek a benefit from spiritual beings in that realm through forbidden practices. Can you give us some examples of what occultism might look like. Absolutely. So we have modern manifestations, right, of occultism, modern practices that are occultism. However, I would first like to point out that historically, it's not something new. It's not something that just started even in the last century or two centuries ago. It's something that has existed since the Garden of Eden. That's where it actually originated. Wow. So when, if you remember, right, when the serpent deceives Eve and he twists the word of God and says, has God really said that you will die if you eat of this fruit? That's what's called the forbidden fruit. And we get certain, certain slang from that, right? The forbidden fruit. And in this case, the serpent asks Eve, did God really say? So he put into question God's word. But then he says this, because he knows that the day you eat of it, you yourself will know how to discern between good and evil. You will know good and evil. So that was secret knowledge that Eve was pursuing. And in that sense, that's the appeal of occultism, because it makes people think they're really seeking out this special esoteric knowledge, secret knowledge. Now, there are different manifestations of it and forms of occultism now. 
I practiced a few myself. So, for example, when you think of seances, um, Ouija board, you know, people playing with the Ouija board. And it's been so popular that now there's a current movie that's out. I think it's called Talk to Me. Mm. And it's conjuring of spirits, trying to communicate with the dead, necromancing. There's so many different forms of it. See, that's um, where introverts are like, nope, don't talk to me. We have the, ad <laughs> the advantage, right? That's correct. Yes. And for example, in our family, my mother consulted mediums, spiritists. We thought that it was our departed, that our dead family members who were talking to us. Sometimes they would go as far as saying it was even the Virgin Mary or other spirits, other entities. But... These are forms of occultism, right? These are manifestations of it. It can extend as far as Satanism. It can extend as far as thinking that, you know, through Freemasonry, that you're somehow tapping into a secret knowledge that nobody else has access to but your group. And spiritual readings, for example, right? People like to go to psychics to foretell their future. There's so many different things that fall into that particular category of occultism. Now, just to clarify... All the seance stuff and the levitation, all the things that you used to do was all before. Absolutely. This was before I knew Christ. Before this was before my conversion, yes. prior to my conversion. Now, my story is a little different in the sense that I knew Christ on and off as a kid. I knew Christ's love, but I wasn't biblically grounded. And I used to own a Ouija board and I didn't think there was anything wrong with it as a believer because I wasn't biblically grounded. And... I didn't have that teaching or psychics or things like that. So mm. in your case, that was before you were a believer. Absolutely before I was a believer. And praise the Lord that you got biblically grounded after you converted. And I, I will mention, though, that ironically, in a lot of circles of this occultism, right, whether it's witchcraft, whether it's going to a spiritual medium, ironically, they use the Bible. Mm. Like they like to have Psalm 91 open to ward off evil spirits, for example. That was the first thing that I noticed when I went to the, um, the house of the, um, the lady that we consulted, the medium. Mm. I remember that she'd have scripture. So in a way, when I saw the Bible there, I thought this is okay with back then Catholicism. We were Catholic, you know, so I thought it was okay. And this is not the house of medium. This is the house of a, a medium, medium, right? Correct. Just making Correct. sure. Just yeah, making absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Since I was involved in Ouija board and would go to psychics sometimes, again, not thinking that there was anything wrong with it. It was kind of intertwined, actually, in Christianity. My question would be, when it comes to mysticism, that mm. is something that I would have categorized as mysticism before, but maybe I'm incorrect. What is mysticism? Is that different than occultism? It's slightly different. Technically, mysticism is the pursuit of a direct and subjective, very subjective personal experience of the divine or spiritual realm. So for example, you'll see mysticism in like a lot of new age, in a lot of even Hinduism. So it involves practicing like meditation, contemplation, and even prayer to try to achieve a state of oneness with the divine, which in Hinduism is called, you know, reaching the state of nirvana. But however, though, it's more practical and subjective than theoretical, meaning it's a, an experience. That's what mysticism involves. Instead of acquiring that experience through knowledge or through reading, for example, scripture, you acquire it through a subjective practice like meditation, I see. for example, or prayer. I see. And contemplation. Correct. Contemplation. Other than thinking, because all the analytical thinkers are a little bit nervous now. So there, there's different forms of meditation. So like, for example, what I used to practice is something called transcendental meditation. And the goal was to try to put your mind in a complete blank state so that you try to attain that oneness. In contemplation, you're observing or focusing on something. And in my opinion, right, when you, when you think that you're actually putting your mind in blank, well, not just, that's what I experienced. I actually experienced it. At that moment, you become a vessel for any spiritual entity on that, in that realm. I think in some cases, they will try to call it something different. Like, remember, I don't know if you remember when I told you that I had read a book on something called telemetry. And in that book, it instructed you on how to summon a certain spirit by focusing on a certain point, by focusing on something that you could envision. So instead of putting your mind on bl in blank, you actually, blanking out your mind, you were focusing on a specific point. And in summoning, I forgot there was a, a specific chant or something that you had to say. Then you would conjure up this spirit who, in a sense, they, they called would turn into like a genie for you and would do your bidding. Those are different manifestations of it. But from a biblical perspective, it all fa falls to us as, as believers. It falls under the category of occultism. 
So mysticism is under the umbrella of yes, occultism? Absolutely. I see. For us, it is, yes. And something you mentioned that I would like to throw out there, because I think it's very important information, is that Philippians 4.8 doesn't tell us to try to put our mind in a blank state. That is correct. That's absolutely right. It says, think about things that are honorable, worthy of praise. It doesn't say... Empty your mind. Doesn't say empty your mind. Very important. Because in my field, they promote that so often. And this is not just a relax your anxiety and find Mm. peace. That's a good point. Trying to focus on blankness, on nothing specifically for the purpose of... What's the purpose of that? Um... So you're trying to tap into the divine. And because it's not a personal being necessarily, like in Christianity, we talk to the Father. Here, you try to become one with the universe, they say, right? That's what technically nirvana is. You become one with the universe. You empty yourself of emotion, of feeling. However, from a biblical perspective, we know that when you empty your mind, it has to get filled with something. Now, in our case, we don't empty our mind. We renew our mind, right? In the case of of believers. Amen to that. Amen. We renew our mind. Our mind is transformed. In the case of emptying your mind, what you're doing, you're becoming a blank slate for one of these spiritual entities. And I just have to um, probably mention this, that from their perspective, they do not think that they're summoning dark entities, From their perspective, a lot of people who are involved in that, and myself included when I did it back then, was really to attain more self-awareness, you know? It's it's more to become spiritually in tune. Ironically, it appeals to you, the spiritual realm, but not Christ. Now, just as a reminder, if you are a person who's trying to learn how to calm down your body and you're trying to learn how do I regulate anxiety, check out Philippians 4.8. It says to meditate on good things. And what about your favorite verse in Isaiah? Which one? Uh, he, he, he will Isaiah keep in perfect 3? mind. You will keep in perfect mind. He who's my, in perfect peace. He whose mind is set on you for in you has he trusted. Yes. Right? I love that. And what I love about that is that there's instructions there. It says it's God's job to provide us that peace. Our job is to trust in the Lord and to focus on the Lord. So if you're looking for a formula, there it is. Now, Wicca, is that under mysticism? Mm. Or is that occultism based off of what their practices? It's also based on it's. It, we would also categorize that as occultism from a biblical perspective, because once again, it's not a mainstream religion, and because it's, it's a form or a way of trying to tap into the divine, tap into the spiritual realm, outside of biblical ordinance, meaning of the way the scripture has ordained it. Right. So the scripture ordains it in a certain way. I think that's where we can get into what the scripture actually says about these things. So in in Deuteronomy 18, which in my opinion is probably one of the most popular passages with regards to these practices, states, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, this is in Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14, is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for these nations which you are about to dispossess. Listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. Uh, Whenever I hear or I read abomination, Mm -hmm. that is such a strong word. That's not just doesn't like. What a strong word. You do not want to be in the category that God says this is an abomination what you're practicing. And and I think that's, that's my love where it's so important to categorize it properly and biblically. Because a lot of times we can develop a certain tolerance for these things. And though we do not have the same form of punishment that we did in the Old Testament, meaning we don't stone anybody Praise who does the Lord. these things. Thank God for Praise that, right? Praise the Lord. Otherwise, I would have been stoned. We would have a population of two. Yeah. <laughs> However, though, God's wrath and judgment is still upon that. And we'll get to that um, later. 100%. Well. Hey, before we go on, I want to remind you... Since I mentioned Wicca, we have a testimony from Keely Daniels, which is our episode number 19, which is titled Set Free from Wicca and the World. So if you want to hear her story, go back and check that out. Also, if you want to hear Manny's amazing testimony, 
what a testimony to the power of the Lord and what he can do, what he can take you from and where he can take you to. You need to check out Manny's testimony episode, which is our first episode ever on this podcast, which is titled From Darkness to Light. So episode number one. Now in the Bible, they used to do things like cast lots in the Old Testament. They did that in the New Testament as well when they were trying to pick Matthias correct. as an apostle. So that is correct. Yeah. Was that occultism? Was that kind of like looking at a magic eight ball and... Well, no, because it was not forbidden by the Lord. It was actually commanded. So in, in the book of Numbers, chapter 26, when they're dividing the land for the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, um, the Lord instructed them to do it by lots. And in the book of Joshua, they once again cast lots. And that's why the apostles, when they did it, remember, this was prior to the arrival of the Holy Spirit in chapter 2. So in Acts one twenty six, the apostles did that. They cast lots to see who would replace Judas. And the lot fell upon Matthias. Now, that was also taken from a very practical proverb that says the lot is cast into the lap, but its very decision is from the Lord. So there was an allowance for it in the Old Testament. After they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you no longer see this practice in the church. The apostles no longer resorted to casting lots Mm -hmm. because even though it was allowed in the Old Testament, right, and they were actually instructed to do certain things via casting lots. Therefore, what they did at that moment was not unbiblical. And it was not seeking knowledge other than through the Lord, because once again, this was a way that they deemed God ordains all things and God is in control of all things. So as we cast this lot, the Lord will control who this lot falls upon. However, once they receive the indwelling Holy Spirit, you will never see the apostles mentioning that again. And you will no longer see the phrase in the New Testament, casting lots. So it wouldn't be acceptable now. No, I would say no, though I do have to be fair and say there is no explicit prohibition by the apostles to do it either. We have a friend at our church who I consider a walking proverb. He uses this a lot. He actually says, sometimes I don't know. And I tell the Lord, Lord, well, I'm going to flip this coin. Now, obviously, I personally don't like it and I don't think I would do it because I believe that we have the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But we must be fair in what we know about scripture. And the scripture in no way does it explicitly prohibit casting lots. But it's also not an apostolic teaching, especially most of the things they wanted us to continue, the apostles reinforced in their teaching. So that's definitely something that they didn't reinforce. And if you think about it, not to cast any shade on on Matthias, right? Funny. However, you never really hear about the works of the Holy Spirit through Matthias, at least in the book of Acts anymore. And even though they chose him, and this is all due respect to our brother Matthias, who I know is in the presence of the Lord and served the Lord faithfully. He had walked with the Lord. However, when the Holy Spirit arrived, if you think about it, ironically, the person that persecuted the church, that wanted to end the church, the apostle Paul, who was called Saul, was chosen by the Holy Spirit to be the apostle to the Gentiles. So if you think about it in a way, really, really, as we see it in a very practical manner, fulfilled through the New Testament, I almost see that apostleship. And this isn't, I don't want to be dogmatic about it either. This is just my opinion that I see the fulfillment almost of that replacement of Judas, the the new apostle with the apostle Paul, where the apostle Paul becomes the apostle technically of the Lord directly. He says, I was not chosen by men. I was not ordained by men, my apostleship. It does not come from man. It comes directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. So I do want to point that out that it was different once they received the Holy Spirit and you no longer see it. But to say that it's explicitly prohibited, I don't think it's a good practice, but I also wouldn't say that the scripture strictly prohibits it now. And how would somebody know back in the day, Old Testament day, that they were, it was divinely inspired? Well, because it was, they were instructed to do so by God. And I think... It was based also on sincerity. A lot of people, I'm sure, were sincere. Lord, I really don't know where to go. I really don't know what to do. So they cast lots and and trusted that God was sovereign over that lot. Amen. And they did not have Google Maps. No, they didn't have Google Maps. Now, if we're talking about occultism and we are thinking about things like mediums and seances like you're talking about, I have a question about contacting the dead. What does the Bible say about that? Well, so as we read previously with regards to consulting the dead, it's strictly prohibited in scripture. God strictly, pro- not just prohibits it, but condemns it. And I think one of the greatest examples of this is the first king of Israel named Saul. And in 1 Samuel, in 1 Samuel 28, the Lord had already departed from Saul. 
and he had already chosen David over Saul. And because of this, Saul sought out a medium and he expressly tells his commander back then, go and seek out a medium, someone who consults the dead, which was ironically something that he himself had condemned before as well and casted them out of Israel. But in this situation, he goes and he consults the dead. And in, in one Chronicles, in the first um, book of Chronicles, chapter 10, 13 through 14, it sheds more light on what happened in Saul's life. And it says that he suffered a great consequence because he had done this for consulting a medium. And it actually led to his, not just condemnation, but his death. So it was something that was strictly, strictly condemned in the Old Testament that you would try to consult the living, I mean, I'm sorry, the dead for the living, right? Are people really contacting people that are now dead that were once living? Is this possible? Are these heavenly beings? Are they demons? Is it all made up? That's a great question. And um, one of the um, probably prime examples of this is in 1 Samuel chapter 28, where you hear of King Saul, who was the first king of Israel. God had already chosen David to be king over him. And God had pretty much departed from Saul. The Holy Spirit had departed from Saul. Saul had disobeyed God. And even when he went to consult the prophet Samuel, Samuel says, God's no longer going to speak to you. That's it. So Saul was devastated and Saul became desperate to know his future. Like what's going to happen to me? Mm. So in his desperation by this time, Samuel had already passed away. So now that he knew that Samuel was dead, he's like, well, who else am I going to ask? Ironically, Saul, who had already previously condemned witchcraft, sorcerers and mediums in Israel. Now he has asked one of his commanders to go and seek out a medium. And once he told her, right, I found a medium in Endor. Let's go. Let's go see her. Ironically, he actually summons the prophet Samuel. So the medium at this moment doesn't know that it's King Saul in Saul in, in 1 Samuel chapter 28. As soon as she begins her seance or her spell, her conjuring spell, she sees a spirit coming up from the ground. She was scared, along, wasn't along she? with two other beings. Do I that, remember that she was scared? Yes, she was scared. Which means, and, and I do have to highlight this because I don't want to allude to the scripture allowing this. Right. Because in scripture, there is something called, and it's a very good um, guideline, theological guideline to have, a hermeneutical guideline that is, right? Uh, that's the art and the science of interpreting scripture. Very important to know this, that that was an exception to the norm. And there's two interpretations to that. One is that it was a demonic being. And the other is that it was Samuel, but it wasn't because of her conjuring that she summoned Samuel. It was actually a further rebuke to King Saul because Samuel says, why have you disturbed me? And he says, God's not answering me through any means. And he goes, and by the way, you're going to be dead tomorrow. So he sentenced him. God sentenced him. So it was more of a rebuke to King Saul. A lot of times these spirits will do something or say something that pleases you. Oh, you're going to be rich. Oh, this is going to happen to you. You're going to be successful. In this case, it was the opposite. So even if it was the prophet Samuel that appeared, and there is that, that is also an orthodox interpretation, right? If it was Samuel. It was an exception to the norm. It was not an establishment of a norm. It was not to say that as believers, we can seek out a medium to consult the dead. No, not at all. That being said, though, it didn't supersede. It didn't uh, override the prohibition of this in Israel. And to a certain degree, when you think about it, even though Saul sought this in First Chronicles 10, 13, it gives us a explanation of what actually happened. And it gives us a broader view of his consequence. It says, because he consulted the dead, God rejected him. And to the point where it led to his actual physical death, that was his punishment. Are there any repercussions, any spiritual repercussions or consequences to participating in occultism or mysticism? Yes. And, and I would also mention that the majority of these apparitions, right, or experiences that people have um, I would say that a great percentage of it is trickery and, and charlatanry. It's not legitimate. It's not real. It's fake. However, when it is real, we do have to emphasize it's demonic spirits, not the departed that are talking to you. It's demonic spirits that are possessing that medium. Now, just as a side note, the if I remember correctly, in the story with the medium and King Saul, was she, she was scared, she right? She was scared. Was Absolutely. she scared likely because she had not really 
conjured that up. That is correct. Yes. Dead people before. I believe before. so. Absolutely. Okay. It was. And also, um, the scripture does tell us in Ecclesiastes 9.5 that the dead know nothing of the world of the living. They don't know what's happening in the world of the living anymore. And in the one place in scripture where it actually details what happens after death, there is only one person who wrote about the afterlife. I'm sorry, who talked about the afterlife. I'm referring to the Lord Jesus in his story of the rich man and Lazarus. Yeah. Jesus is the only person in the entire scripture that gives us a detailed explanation of what happens after death. And there he says that Lazarus was concerned about his brothers who were still alive. And he said, send me, right? Or send somebody to warn them. And he says, nobody can leave here. Nobody can go and warn them. And he says, no, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. And in this case, it's the Lord Jesus that is giving us that vivid and detailed explanation of what happens in the afterlife, which in theology is called the intermediary state, the intermediate state, I'm sorry, the intermediate state that's in between death and the resurrection from the dead. Other than that, there is no way for the dead to communicate with the living. Now that you're discussing the intermediate state, I think people are going to have questions, especially if they have a Catholic background about purgatory. You want to expand upon mm -hmm, that a little good, bit? Good, good. Yes, well, the, the idea and the concept of purgatory, even though it's a, a doctrine within the Catholic Church, in, in Scripture, you do not see the word purgatory, nor do you see the idea of purgatory. And it's taken from a passage where the Lord Jesus is, is using an analogy to describe, you know, that if you don't forgive somebody, um, their sins, you know, God's not going to forgive you. And he uses an analogy of somebody not paying off a debt or, or not forgiving the other person's debt after them having been forgiven and says, he's going to throw you in jail until you pay back the last penny. Ironically, that and from an apocryphal book, they get the concept, the idea of purgatory. But there is no biblical basis for the concept and the idea or the doctrine of purgatory. Um, there is no, the, besides the intermediate state, right, which is you're either in hell or you're in the third heaven or paradise. There is no in-between state between that, an intermediate of an intermediate state, I guess, you know, um, kind of like the, the movie in Inception. The thing is, um, the scripture doesn't mention this and it'd be extremely risky for somebody to depend on that after death. Like if you haven't really obeyed the Lord, you haven't received the Lord, you haven't repented from your sins. Don't count on somebody praying for you after you're dead, right? To get into heaven. Get it right on this side. Absolutely. The death. scripture does state in the book of Hebrews, right? That there is only what? Once man dies, he is appointed to die once. And after this judgment, there is no in between. There is nothing else beyond death. There is nothing in the sense of I'm going to get a second chance beyond death. No. If somebody prays enough. No. Even, even if the holiest person on earth prayed for me, beyond death, the Lord Jesus says, right? And that's why I really like the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Because see, the rich man thought that because he was a descendant, a literal descendant of Abraham, that he would automatically be in Abraham's bosom in paradise. On the contrary, no, Jesus shows it has nothing to do with the success or the richness you have in this life to guarantee that you're going to get into heaven. And there's nothing in scripture that tells us that our access to heaven will depend on somebody's prayer or mass for us. No. And it's, it's extremely risky to depend on that. I would say stick with scripture. Stick with what's clear in scripture. So purgatory we see as acceptable in the Catholic church as they believe. In the Christian church... Apart from the Catholic Church, do you see occultism in the church? Things that are acceptable, maybe, by some that are in the church, but actually aren't? Well, coming from a Pentecostal background, I would say yes. And I won't say that every Pentecostal church is like this, because I will tell you, our church originally was not like that. But uh, you do have practices, like, for example, people who claim to be prophets. People who claim to be prophets and say, they love to use the expression, thus says the Lord, as if that somehow is their seal of approval. Like, you better really listen to me and you better not even question me because, because I'm saying, thus saith the Lord, which was an expression of the Old Testament prophets, right? You don't hear the Apostle Paul use those expressions. You don't hear the Apostle Peter say those expressions because the Holy Spirit spoke directly through them. But in this case, these people who are self-proclaimed 
self-named prophets. And they love it when people say, oh, the prophet so-and-so is coming to visit us, you know. And to the point where you and I experienced this in, in, in one of the congregations that we went to before, or where there was someone who claimed to have the gift of prophecy and would actually have people line up, like to hand out prophecies as if they're groceries or, or lottery tickets yeah, or something. You I, know? I think I have this gift, they would say, and it's not even just at our old church, but I think this happens often enough. I think I have this gift, so go ahead and line up so I can see if the Lord has something for you. That is correct. And most of the times in a lot of the hyper-Pentecostal churches, the prophecies will be very vague. Ironically, though, there are a lot of people who don't really know scripture well. And because of this, they will be extremely influenced by that particular prophecy. So if somebody tells you, for example, hey, the Lord said, this says the Lord, I want you to do this and you're going to be successful in this area. And you quit your job to pursue that. And then things don't work out. A prophet could probably tell you, hey, the, the, church, the Lord is going to fill your church to the point where it, it, people aren't going to fit in the church. And you're, in, you're going to have to expand. You're going to have to buy the next build, the building next door. And you as a pastor go and buy that building next door. Is that a little bit of the name it and claim it? Word of faith movement. Correct. And that's another, that's an other manifestation, in my opinion, of a form of occultism in the church. I was thinking of prosperity gospel. Well, that's what okay. it is. Yeah. The word of faith movement, prosperity gospel, and... That has a lot more to do with metaphysics, right? Where you imagine something, you envision it, and then you Put it out there. manifest it by proclaiming it. We also have things like the law of attraction. Some believers adhere to that particular law. They think you attract whatever you think of the most, but that's all metaphysics. That's not biblical. If a lot of you have read the book, The Secret, which I believe it was something that put new agey metaphysics even though they claim to know Christ through Christ consciousness, that is not Christ. Be careful. And the irony is the name is the secret. And we're talking about the secret revelation Absolutely. of knowledge. So Absolutely. be careful. If, I, ironically, some people say, I'll put it out there to the universe. Yeah. And they don't mean Correct. God. Correct. Or maybe Absolutely. they mean their God, their version of God. I put it out there to the universe so that it comes back. I, w I don't say anything negative at all because then bad things will happen to me. I only put out positive things and claim something and, and be careful due to that i believe so many people have embraced um, occultism without knowing that it's occultism mm -hmm. hollywood is 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 a is a great example of that where they in almost every other movie it has to do all well, you have good energy good vibes expressions like these right Eek. and for example you, karma they use the word karma a lot different phrases that really come from occultism and you will hear from believers. ideas that are unbiblical ideas or not just unbiblical, but even anti-biblical ideas. And a lot of believers who do not know scripture will sometimes adhere or believe these ideas, you know, and use this terminology. And I think your anxiety must go up if you are really worried about if I say anything negative or feel anything negative, atrocities will come, then your anxiety must shoot up like crazy. And then what do you do? That's then you right. got to, Then you have to work even harder. I don't think that's exactly how the Bible works, how our Lord works. What would you say to people who feel they're being extra spiritual by practicing these things, that they're getting closer to God? Or things like it's God who gives them this special message. What would you say to that? That's a very good question as well. I think that there's a lot of times where we want to have a spiritual experience, even as believers, right? We want to draw close to God. But instead of drawing close to God, we rely on our impulses. We rely on our subjective experience, you know. And a lot of times Christians who think that they have a gift from the Holy Spirit, yeah. even if it deviates from Scripture, even if that gift is not in the list found in Corinthians, where Paul talks in Corinthians chapter 12 about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Something like contacting the dead yes. or yeah. God bringing the <laughs> like dead to me. The apparitions, right? People suddenly say, hey, the dead, visit me. And I could feel when somebody has departed. There's nothing in scripture that says that this is a gift of the Holy Spirit. On the contrary, sorcery is actually falls under the category uh, or any spiritual experience outside of, of biblical belief um, based on the scriptures. Um, you'll see that sorcery falls under the category of works of the flesh. Because it's not from the Holy Spirit. This is your own flesh. That sometimes appeals, to, this appeals to us because we see it in movies, right? And because we want to feel extra special. Like if we have this special connection with God through this particular gift 
So right. if someone feels that, that they are given a gift by God, God is sending prior living people, dead people to them, you would tell them to question that. Absolutely. Line that up with scripture. 100%. My question would be, that show gift me is not it, in the scripture. Show Absolutely. me where it says it in scripture that this is something And once from God. again, it's not a fruit or a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's actually a work of the flesh. And to be honest with you, when it comes to that, I think a lot of people who want to have that extra connection, that feel that special connection, have to really realize what the apostolic teaching is on special connection and on utilizing any other form of mediator with God, whether it's the dead. And to be honest with you, even whether it's the departed saints, because see that, that some people say, okay, well, these are wicked dead people for sure. I'm not going to consult them. But what about the holy dead people? Like for example, the saints. Yeah, I don't think anybody sets out uh, that's a believer to, to find somebody that is with a devil. That is correct. They all want to that find somebody correct. that's holy. Correct, correct. Or loved one. But even in the case of departed apostles, departed disciples, departed, you know, holy people that we know, our mother or our dad who was a, a devout disciple to the Lord Jesus Christ, the scripture never tells us to consult that person or somehow now they're closer to God because they're dead. So in Catholicism, they pray to the saints because they feel they're closer to God and they could pray on your behalf. But the scripture nowhere prescribes, tells us to do this, to seek somehow God's favor. On the contrary, the scripture is clear in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There is only one mediator between God and man, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the man known as Jesus Christ. He is our only mediator. We don't need any other form of of connection to God other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And for those of you that have practices where you're, you've had a loved one that has died and you set up candles or you do some sort of ritual on their anniversary, I think that's okay. That's, that's something that we do sometimes for grief to honor people. But it's important to remember that if your person that has died is in heaven, they lack nothing. Correct. They lack Good nothing. Point. Good point. They don't, they're not in grief anymore whatsoever. Sometimes when we do those things, it's helpful for us to help us in the grief as we remember them. It's not something that they need on their end if they're in heaven because they are in the fullness of God. Amen. Do you think that some people that are involved that believe they have special revelation from Jesus, they are able to see dead people, they're able to have messages with dead people, whatever it may be, that maybe sometimes they believe that way because of what they're taught at the pulpit. Do you think that that's ever occurred that maybe they genuinely love the Lord and they're just misguided or how do you? Hmm. That's a great question. I think that when it comes to things taught from the pulpit, it's not necessarily that I don't think any preacher actually teaches that particular um, thing from the pulpit. There is a syncretism that they might teach, like, for example, the um, name it and claim it. Right? What about with the culture of the church? Do you think that that might promote that extra spiritual longing and that extra, like seeking extra spiritual gifts that you believe are mm. from the Lord. I think, I think that's more so due to um, a lack of proper teaching from the pulpit mm. or a lack of addressing this from the pulpit, being explicit about it from the pulpit. So what happens is if you're not hearing this explicitly from the pulpit, but then you're watching TV four or five hours, six hours a day, watching movies every weekend. And through these movies, through these mediums, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you actually get, and these channels, right? You get all this data and information that feeds your mind with this idea. A lot of people can be sincere and develop this idea, thinking this is from God. What I'm getting is, and because I don't hear my pastor directly address this, they assume that it's okay. And because honestly, they don't read scripture, but I think anyone who does read scripture and is somehow involved in this, sometimes knowing that this is wrong, well, then that's a different case, right? In that case, I think we should be bold in addressing them and in correcting them in love because there's some really grave consequences for accessing and participating in the occult. I guess I was thinking about in some churches, certain gifts are... Mm, I see what are, you're saying. Highlighted. Are highlighted and are valued. And I'm just wondering if psychologically people want to get to these gifts. Mm. And so they... I see what you're saying. Because of the culture yes, of the yes, church. Yes, yes, I understand. And I think I can relate to that um, due to my prior experience in, in the Pentecostal church, right? Where you'd have people visiting who were so-called prophets. 
And to be honest with you, when you see them display this so-called gift and prophesy to people, tell them their future, reveal certain things to them that supposedly nobody else knows, very similar almost to a psychic, very similar. Yet say that this is anointed by God. This is a gift from the Holy Spirit. Because what else it would it kind be? Of, kind of gives you a certain misconception of what power is. I mean, because you begin to think, oh man, I wish I had that. Or I want them to talk to me, to prophesy to me. I used to be like that. And a lot of people will unfortunately develop a, that misconception and think this is power of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, they will develop that. But I think we should have a different attitude towards those who are unknowingly involved in it, that know scripture, and sometimes new believers or simply believers that don't know scripture and are misguided, right? Because of what they hear or what they see. And isn't that our ultimate prophecy is the Bible? Absolutely. Isn't that what is considered our prophecy? It is absolutely. The greatest and surest word of God is the written word of God, right? And that's what, and that's um, what we have the now. apostle Peter tells us. We have the more sure word of God, the more sure guide in a dark place. It's a light that guides us. It's the word of God. We don't need other entities or other spirits or anything like that. So if you want special knowledge, read the word. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the greatest special knowledge, but it's not done in secret, right? It's something that's publicly uh, accessible. It's something that's open to everyone and it's offered to everyone. The mystery has been revealed. Absolutely. The greatest mystery has been revealed. Mental health wise, the question that I would pose to you is, are you okay without special knowledge, a special spoken word from God? Are you okay? If you're not okay, why not? That's something to go check out. That probably doesn't have to do anything with the gifts. It has to do with you and what's going on inside of your heart that maybe needs to be resolved or healed. And in all honesty, um, I think I should also address this, that with regards to those charismatic gifts, right, to the, the power gifts of the Holy Spirit, I believe that there are people who genuinely have that gift. Although I do think it's very rare to come across that person who genuinely has that gift. And those who do aren't going to be so quick to prophesy. And they're probably going to be pretty scared. Yes, they are. Scared that they would pronounce something or say something that does not come from God. They're going to have a certain um, reluctance, right? Or they're going to be hesitant to say something that they feel, man, I hope this is not my own heart. They're not going to be in a rush to say it. They're going to hold it with reverence. With a lot of reverence and scrutiny. Mm. They're going to really scrutinize and say, wait a minute, is this my own heart or is this you, Lord? And we have the example of Elijah who the scripture says was a man subject to very similar passions to ours. Yet he prayed fervently that it would not rain upon the earth and it did not rain. But if you remember that story, when he approaches King Ahab and tells him, hey, it's not going to rain. You don't really see that prior to that, he's praying fervently saying, man, Lord, if I'm going to approach King Ahab and I'm going to say, the Lord says it's not going to rain. I better, I better know that this is really from you. And that's why when you see people like the Apostle Paul when he's in Thessalonica preaching the word of God in the synagogue and the Jews rejected him to the point where some of them wanted to kill Paul. So the church tells him, go somewhere else, right? And now Paul is in Berea. And when he gets to Berea, the author of Acts, Luke says, and these were more noble than the Jews in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was true. Mm -hmm. So even though it was Paul, they're like, wait a minute, this is moving to my heart. And, and it's breaking my heart when you speak the word of God. It's leading me to contrition. But I need to know that this feeling that I have or that the supernatural power that you're displaying is in line with the word of God. It's Paul. a great example. And what does the scripture say of them? In chapter 17 of Acts, they were more noble. Ironically, the others who were not noble wanted to kill Paul. Let's say that everyone's been listening now. They have found that either they're involved in occultism somehow, or their loved one is, and they want to know, what do I do now? What would you say to them? That Jesus Christ offers a, a true power. Jesus Christ offers true knowledge. Um, the knowledge and the power obtained through occultism is it pales in comparison to the power that Christ has. And that's real power. A lot of people, one of their, uh, the greatest appeals in occultism is that they're going to have access to the certain power, either manipulate these beings, spirits, demons, whatever they be, you know, into doing their bidding. Um, somehow, like through the name it and claim it, right? Very similar to metaphysics. You, you envision it and then you manifest it. And it's one of those things where they feel that they have this power. 
The problem with accessing that form of power is that it takes more than it gives. Because when you open up that door, it's a spiritual gateway to a realm that you should not be involved in outside of Christ. And when you do, you do open yourself up even to demonic possession, demonic influence. And that is one of the gravest consequences of it. But I could see the appeal is that people pursue a, some form of power. They want to experience something greater than themselves. The thing is the greatest experience you can have and the greatest power we can ever have access to is found in our Lord Jesus Christ, who the scripture says when he rose from the dead, declared to the apostles in Matthew 28, 19, and behold, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, because of this, go and make disciples of all the nations. When we realize that in Christ, we have the greatest power in all of existence, in all of the universe, is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And when we give our lives to Jesus, the scripture says, and to all those who believed in him, in the gospel of John chapter one, he gave unto them the authority, the power to become sons of God, children of God. And if you really want to experience true power, you're going to find that power in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not a telepathic or telekinetic power, by the way. It's not a power to get rich. It's not a power to, to materialize something that you're thinking about and whether it's a Mercedes or gold or what have you. No, that's nonsense. It's greater power. It's power that surpasses all riches. Spiritual riches. Right? It's, it's, it's power that gives you peace in the midst of a storm. It's power that, a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's power that gives you joy in the midst of the worst circumstances like cancer. In the midst of death, you can still rejoice in the Lord. That's true power. It's power that really transforms your mind. That changes you from a grumpy old person or from a, or, or, or from a drunkard. What did you call me? And, uh, it changes you. It's true transforming power. Not that trickery, not that kind of power that's offered in occultism. It's a power that gives you a love for your enemies. It's a power that gives you the assurance of your salvation. And that power is given by our Lord Jesus Christ. So would you tell them, stop, repent, absolutely. seek Jesus, read the Bible. Yes, absolutely. Find a Bible-believing church, fellowship, have accountability. Absolutely. To anyone who is involved, you know, if, if you've opened yourself up to those things, even if you're a believer, especially if you're not a believer and you've practiced these things, as I did, you will know eventually that it takes a lot more than it gives and in some cases can lead to demonic possession. That's probably the gravest consequence, right? It separates you from God. And um, as a believer, if you're involved in these things and for sure repent, and, and read scripture and ask the Lord to forgive you. But also if you're a believer who did not know that this was wrong, well, the Lord is telling you today through his word and through this podcast that he wants to call you to a true revelation, to true, to true knowledge, which is only found in the word of God. It's only found in our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Amen. And no one can come to the father, but by me. Amen. A last thought that I had was, I think that sometimes people go, believers go into occultism because they just want to know the future. Mm. So if the Lord says, don't do it, and it's abomination, don't do it. Even if you want to know the future, sometimes we are nosy for our own futures, but you need to manage your anxiety. So there are just some things that you're not going to know. There are just some things that the almighty, the one who knows everything that he knows and he is sovereign. So if it's just that you want to know, you can't go get that through horoscopes and psychics and those things. You just have to learn how to manage your anxiety and how to be happy with the now. Ask yourself, why, why do you need to know so much? Why is it so difficult to live in the now and what the Lord is asking you to do now and to be satisfied now? Why do you need to be in the future? That might have more to do with mental health stuff than anything else. So if we jump into scripture section, do you have a scripture that pertains to what we discussed today? Yes, I do. And I, I love this scripture in the book of Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 21. Um, it says, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, 
But who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Now listen to what happened. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus. So Ephesus was a known epicenter of a lot of occultism, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts, which is occultism, brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. I love this passage because it shows us that when you encounter the word of God, when you encounter true power, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, you see the contrast with the so-called power of occultism. You see the contrast with darkness. And also it produces a healthy fear in you. I know that's not a very popular topic, but to have a healthy fear of God to practice these things. As a believer, you should fear to practice these things, right? But also what I, I love that the scripture mentions, the value of those books by an earthly measurement like money, mm. right? And it says, it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. And sometimes that does have to happen where we see and determine, man, I bought these books or people are so involved in these things. They have items that, you know, are related to the occult. A lot of times we don't want to let these things go. It's a, it's probably a family thing, something that I inherited from my mother, something that I inherited from a family member. Oh, my grandmother used this or what have you. And when you give everything up for the Lord Jesus, even of it's worth 50,000 pieces of silver, you realize that you've inherited now riches that cannot be measured with money. And I love that it says they burned this in the public. Those things that were done in secret were now exposed in public. Amen. Something I just realized that we forgot to mention, which I think is something that some people in the church, depending on which church that you go to, finds acceptable, but as a form of occultism is santeria. That is correct. So we don't have to expand upon it because we're out of time. They can also go back to your testimony. Yes, yes, absolutely. The first episode from Darkness to Light. But there are some who believe, you know, that's fine. I, in my house, I can do Olympia. Right? Correct. I, correct. Can, I can just do a, a cleaning that, that gets out Spiritual evil spirits. Spiritual cleansing. Right? Correct. Yes. And I can do the stuff that you do in Santeria. And it's fine. It's kind of a, a syncretism with that the religion. That is correct. Right? They mislabel it as white magic, right? Or And, and in reality. Better yeah. and lighter. No, no, no. It's still dark magic because it's, it's outside of scriptural teaching. That's not at all what the scripture commands us to do. On the contrary, the scripture commands us to stay away from those things. You want to pray for a house? Go ahead. You want to Olympia? Run the other direction. Take a shower. Take, take a shower. <laughs> all right. Spanglish jokes. Okay. The scriptures that I brought today were 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 to 22. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Mm. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Clear passage. <laughs> Very clear. The second one is 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So if we jump into our takeaway section, what's the one thing you would like everybody to remember? If they don't remember anything else in the show, this one thing, what would that be? Christ is the greatest power in revelation offered to us. There is no mystery greater than the mystery of the incarnation. There is no mystery greater than God manifested in the flesh in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. And only true peace and true joy can truly offer you a satisfaction that you seek, a wholeness that you seek, sometimes through these occultic practices, right? I, for, for one, sought knowledge. I sought wisdom. I sought peace. I sought prosperity through these things, but I will tell you, it left me empty. It, it, it not only empty, but when it did fill me, it filled me with darkness until I gave my life to the Lord Jesus. And when I found the Lord Jesus, I found true love, true joy. And the one takeaway that I'd like to share is that no matter how caught up you, in, you are in it, you might have the belief that, or the idea that you can escape it. Because a lot of times, um, these demonic forces, when it's real, they don't just let you go. 
But Jesus Christ is the end of demons. Jesus Christ is the end of occultism. When you find Christ, you find power, you find light that will dispel all that darkness in your life. Sometimes there are practices that you can't get rid of. Like I, for example, when I converted and I was still trying to practice astral projection and transcendental meditation, I would still fall into it. My body was so accustomed to it. My mind was so accustomed to it until I cried out to the Lord. And I really believed that the Lord Jesus could deliver me from that. And after the Lord Jesus delivered me from that, never again in my life have I experienced that darkness again, never again. And it's beautiful to walk in the light of Christ. It's beautiful. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus, Today is the day. That's what the scripture says. Amen. Today is the day. Do not delay. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Manny Elias, my beloved husband, for sharing your expertise with us and your knowledge. We appreciate that so much. My pleasure. And to all of you that are listening and to all of you that are watching, we are so glad that you joined us today. We hope that you will continue. Don't forget to like and subscribe and to follow us so that way you can be aware of what's going on. We do have social media on Facebook and on Instagram. So if there's some information that we can't put on the podcast episode, you will find it there. So don't forget to do that. Also, it helps encourage us to keep on going and that we know that you are enjoying this and getting benefit out of that. We do want to help you get rooted and edified, Amen. built up as the body. Now, Mr. Elias, will you pray us out? Absolutely. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, thanking, thanking you, sovereign King of the universe, King of kings and Lord of lords, that when you ascended on high, Lord, when you resurrected from the dead, the scripture says that you have a name that is above all other names, not just in, in the age when you resurrected, but even in our age for all time, your name is above all names. You are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when you ascended on high and you sat at the right hand of the father, you ascended above all principalities, all powers, all dominions, all thrones, Lord. And your power is the greatest power in the universe. And you have the power to break the chains, to break the bondage of occultism. Whether it's somebody who has in inherited these practices from their family, like me as a child saw this and observed this in their mom and their grandma, whoever it is, Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would break those chains and that you would deliver that person right now that you would deliver them, Father, from the bondage of the devil, that you would remove the blindfold from their eyes, that they could see the light of the gospel, how beautiful it is, how majestic it is to be in your light. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would break any demonic, Father, um, hold over any person who, who probably... Um, practices this, Lord, not knowing that it is wrong, not knowing that it is dark, that you would make them known, Father, of this darkness and that they would completely turn away from that darkness and that they would come into your light. I pray, Father, for any believers, Father, who, who have been practicing some of these things, who have formed a syncretism and who have not been taught, Father, from, from the pulpit. I pray, Father, that they study the word of God, that they get into your word and that they would experience true freedom, true freedom from these things, Father, that you would give them correct teaching, Father, that would lead them into a life full of the Holy Spirit to not seek any other spirit, but the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much, Father, for your love and your mercy. I pray that you be with all those who hear this, this message today. I pray, Father, that you're salvation come to them and to their homes in Jesus mighty name. Amen. All right. Until next time. Ciao. God bless. Take care.